Hi, how would you like to have perfect peace, peace of mind, peace in your heart, no matter what was happening in your life? Is that even possible? Scripture says it is. And no matter what's happening around you, the ones you love the most, you can be at peace. I think it's possible because that's what Jesus teaches. That's what Paul certainly teaches. I'm going to, especially in the last half of the sermon, talk about something Paul gives us <clears throat> as recipes, as points that will absolutely give us peace of mind no matter what's going on. The reason I'm giving this teaching is I needed it. I am not a person who relaxes, is at peace, uh, just not. So I thought you would like to hear what I've learned over the 30, 40 years I've been trying to practice it. When I practice it, I have peace. When I don't, I'm a mess. How's that sound? So I don't know on top of all that when everything's going to hit the fan, the time of greatest trouble the world's ever seen, it's coming. BlackRock, a, uh, an investment firm, financial firm, has said that we're coming into a great recession, just announced today, and the uh, things we did in 2008 are not going to work this time, they said. Warren Buffett's warning about it, and others are talking about it. But the time of greatest trouble will include a financial meltdown, of course, collapse of the dollar, and all kinds of things that could mean for you and your income, your savings, your investments. In the meantime, there's concerns about marriages, our marriages, what state they're in, our family situations, world events, pain and suffering we're going through, all kinds of things that can take away peace if we let it. But since, my point is, since all these horrible things, worst, the worst time the world's ever seen, are soon to be upon us, probably within the decade, maybe within a few months maybe, or years, but soon. We need to learn how to have peace no matter what's going on. So hello everyone, I'm Philip Shields. I'm the host and founder of this website, Light on the Rock. And thank you for inviting us into your home or letting us be in your home. I hope you're checking out my previous sermons, hundreds of them now on this website. Use the search bar and you can Type in one or two key words, that's the best, just one or two key words, and see what pops up. You'll be surprised how many blogs, audio sermons, and video sermons there are. I'm also going to be re-recording some of my older sermons from 10 or 12 years ago, and this time as more to the point, faster, in getting to the point, shorter sermons, maybe 50, 45, 50 minutes, as videos. Anyway, back to today's teaching, and so it's easy to have peace of mind when everything's going well. When there's no pain, no suffering, you're in perfect health, you got a great job you love, uh, great marriage, great family, beautiful home, beautiful cars, you enjoy your church fellowship, you enjoy your pastor, you think he's great, and you have enough money and income to do anything you want, or just about. If that's your story, then having peace of mind and being content and no worries may be a little easier for you. But when that all starts to fall apart, how will you be? Peace, you see, is tested when you're told you have cancer, when you're told your wife wants a divorce, when you're told that your child got hurt at school and he's, he's in the hospital, or you're in constant pain and it's not being healed. But we, you'll also find that it's the hard times of life that help us grow that help us be strong, that build spiritual muscle, build character, helps us mature, perfects us. Uh, you might want to see the sermon I gave on perfection, God's perfection, and I go into that quite a bit. I found personally that people who never seem to have major hardships, uh, to me, they, excuse me, to, to me they just seem shallow. Uh, they do, they seem shallow. I need to just get my glasses just for a second. So to me, 
people I feel have never, or, or it seems never have gone through severe things in their lives, they just seem shallow. At least to me they do. So I think you'll find that you're growing a lot, especially in the hard times, especially in the hard times. Now, Matthew 6, verses 23, or 25 to 34, Matthew 6, 25 to 34, um, King and Savior says, you guys quit worrying because your worrying actually is showing me you don't trust me. You don't trust God. You feel you have to worry about it and worry, worrying is not going to change one thing about the problem that you're facing, that you're worrying about. It's not going to change one thing. It might make you sick. It might give you a heart attack. It might give you a stroke. I could have those too. So let's read it, Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, about your body, what you'll put on. Life's more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the, look at the birds. They don't worry and God feeds them. Which of you by worrying can add a single cubit, about 18 inches to his stature? So why do you worry about, verse 28, why do you worry about clothing? Look at the lilies, and God clothes the grass. Of course, he'll take care of you too, O you of little faith. The end of verse 30. Now verse 31, I'm doing a little bit of a paraphrase for time's sake. Do not worry, wondering what you're going to do for eat, for eating. What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Now it's easy not to worry about those things if you have lots of money. If you're among the people we help out in the poor areas who have one or two meals a day at most, yeah, you can start to wonder what we're going to do for food tomorrow and the next day. 42, Father knows all these things, the Gentiles, these, I'm sorry, for after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knows exactly that you need all these things. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. All these things you're worrying about are going to be added to you, he says. Therefore, how many times has he said this? Do not worry. It's a command. Worrying certainly means you are not having peace of mind. If you ever find yourself saying, oh, I'm so worried about, or I feel worried about, you're not experiencing the peace of mind I'm talking about here that Paul and others talk about too. So how are we doing? Do we ever worry? Of course I worry. I like to change the words I feel I, I'm concerned about, whatever. But, but if it's worry, we're breaking the command spoken three, four, five times in that passage. Do not worry. Never makes things better. Now, notice that Jesus also combines the concept of worrying with the concept of little faith or no faith. Worrying, why is that? Because worrying shows we've lost confidence in God the Father or, in G or Jesus Christ to take care of our situations. We've lost confidence. We've lost faith. We've lost trust. We've lost belief in God our Father. That's what Yeshua himself said, O you of little faith. And so to defeat worry, we have to exercise some steps, some, some uh, discipline to cast out the worry and to put in faith and trust instead. Matthew uh, 10, verses 16 to 21, even talks about a time when brothers will be turning other brothers in. Uh, you can see that the, the stage is being set for that already. And when you're called before the courts, don't worry what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. So we can have perfect peace even in the face of death and pain and suffering. That's what we want to be talking about today. By being at peace and having peace, I am not. I mean, we're not worrying. We're not stressed out by things happening to us. If you're feeling a lot of stress, you don't have this peace that I'm going to be talking about. I'm still working on it too. So I preach to myself too. But someone at peace is not constantly worried about all the issues of life. So we have to have faith in God no matter what to be at peace. Where does this peace come from? It's not something people can conjure up. It's not something that you can hope for and, 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 and bring into your life by yourself. The way we get to this peace is we have to die to the self. The old self has to die in us. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified 
with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Boy, I wish I could say that all the time. But Christ lives in me. No wonder he could say to the Thessalonians and the Philippians and others, I was just reading Thessalonians again, copy, copy me, follow what I'm doing, use my life as an example. I, I, don't have the, I don't have the character yet to be able to say that. Copy me in all things. You know, I still have issues. But that's what Paul says. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. But we, you see, I no longer live. Yeshua, Jesus said, carry your cross. Each one of you has to carry your cross. And come after me. Okay, he goes on. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me, who loved me, who loved me, loved you, and gave himself for me. We won't be able to work up godly peace. This is something that comes from the life of Jesus living inside of us. We're told clearly that godly peace, the godly kind, is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the third listed fruit. Love, joy, peace. And then the next one is a natural result of that peace, long-suffering, and all that. But all of those nine, I think, fruit of the Spirit are all part of the gift of God in it through His Spirit, the fruit of His Spirit. That's what I meant to say. So Galatians 5, 22 to 24, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and the rest there. And those who are Christ, verse 24, have crucified the flesh. There it is again. It's what Jesus said. Pick up your cross. Come follow me. If you're picking up your cross and following someone, you're, you're being led to your death. The death of the old self. The new you has to come about. The new me. It's not a matter of fixing the old. We get rid of the old. We get rid of the old. We're given a, we become a new creation. So anyway, uh, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now, you see how the death of self is mentioned again. So when we invite Jesus, Yeshua, into our lives, we find his peace his, is nudging us. When we have the gospel of peace, in fact, I mentioned Ephesians 6.15, the gospel of peace. It's the good news of peace. Those are like the shoes we put on that can take us about with this good news. It's what gives us stability and helps us to walk plainly and strongly. It's what gives energy to our feet and talk about the fact that a big part of the good news is about the way and the, the way, the truth, and the life into it, which is Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.14, Ephesians 2.14 says, He himself is our peace. So if you want to have the peace we're going to talk about, it has to be the life of Jesus Christ being led and lived inside of us. So there's no complete, true, permanent peace without complete presence of Christ. You can look peaceful, but he is our peace. The, the godly kind comes from him. So it's important to grasp, true grasp. True peace comes by God's Holy Spirit and the indwelling of Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus the Christ. When we're acting in worry or we've lost our temper, we're not letting Jesus rule our lives. So vocalize the words more often. Say these things. Literally say them. Just say, my king, my brother, my savior, my Jesus. Please come into my life. Please come and live again, this time in me. I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life. Please, please come. Be my joy. Be my love. Be my peace. Be my long-suffering. Be all of these things. Isaiah 9 is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. Isaiah 9, verse 6, uh, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Any of you who are of Jewish faith listening to, to this, understand that there is a prophecy for a son of God to come. It's right here. It doesn't get read much in the synagogues. Unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, 
It's not talking about a plain, normal human being here. Everlasting Father, I'll explain that some other time, and Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. This Prince of Peace wants us to have peace even when there are giant, giant problems in front of us like David faced in the form of Goliath. Are we focusing on the Goliaths of our lives, the pain and the suffering and the, the health issues and the financial problems and everything else we're facing? Or are we focused on the Prince of Peace like David did when he said to Goliath, how dare you, big boy, talk like that to the people of God you uncircumcised so-and-so. I'm going to cut your head off today by the power of God Almighty, the power of Yehovah, the Lord. He will be my strength. That's what he looked at. We can have peace in our hearts, trusting God. We're not concentrating on the giant problems we have in our lives. We're just not, but on the giant killer, Jesus, God. Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4. I'll read verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace. You. Not me. I won't keep myself in perfect peace. That's why you, we've really got to bring God into the story. You, God, will, bring, will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you, has faith in you, believes in you. Are you getting the connection? So what are you facing right now? I mean you. I mean you. Health issues, lack of money, problems at work. I mean you. So one thing to remember as we're going through our trials, God hears us, but he doesn't always give us the answers he wants, we want to have. God stays with us all. Never leave you, nor forsake you is there. I am with you. I've heard that from him. I am with you, so don't, um, don't ever think that because you're not getting the, the answers that you ask for, God who knows better sometimes, many times knows that the trials, the tests, the pain, the suffering, emotional and physical, other ways, is actually doing a lot for us that he will need to use in the kingdom. So even Jesus, the Son of God, let me read it in Hebrews 5, verse 6 to 10, verses 6 to 10. He also prayed to God. And, he, and it says in another place, you're a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek about Jesus, verse 7. <clears throat> Who in the days of his flesh, Gethsemane in particular, when he'd offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears, vehement cries and tears, Tears. It's okay to cry. It's okay to weep. With vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard. He was praying to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though, but though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. He learned obedience. What we're saying here is when he was saying, is there any other way? Is it possible for this cup to pass for me? But not my will. I'm here to do your will. I'm here to do what you told me to do. He learned obedience in the agony he was going through where he sweat blood. Having been perfected, verse 9, he became the author of eternal salvation for all who obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. My point is Jesus himself was heard, but he didn't get a pass from what he was called and sent to do, to die on the cross. But he obeyed, was completed, perfected by trusting, even though even in his case it meant his death. This is an important point. We have to look at trials and tests differently. Even prayer and answered prayer, or what we think isn't answered prayer. Sometimes God says, you're going to have to go through that tr trouble. You're not going to be healed of this. Or your, 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 your finances are going to continue to, to be a problem because I have this and this I'm working on inside of you. 
We have to trust God so deeply that even when he chooses not to heal your son, not to let you have the woman of your dreams to be your wife, assuming you're single, <laughs> okay, or let you continue in severe pain, we will trust him. We will love him. But remember, he never forsakes us. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I think it's Hebrews 13, 5. In the book of Daniel, I forget what chapter it was, but in the book of Daniel, around, around chapter 3 or so, I'm not sure, Daniel's three friends were cast into the fiery furnace for not bowing down to the golden altar, the golden image. But when they looked again, there were four people in there. It was the Son of God walking among them, walking with them, in the fire with them. So even when we go through the fiery trials, don't think it's some unusual thing, as if you're the only one going through it. But Jesus won't leave you. You've got to believe that, even if the pain and the troubles continue, or else the rest of the teaching won't work. So the simple facts of life, not everything we pray for and hope for is going to happen, okay? Because he has his reasons. John 14, 27. But still, in the storm, I love the song, I will praise you in the storm, or praise, praise you in the storm, I think is the title of it. Praise you in the storm. But anyway, please, you might want to listen to that. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't let it. Neither let it be afraid. So hard to follow that unless you get yourself out of the way, let the self die, and let Jesus be your life. This was said literally just hours before he'd be illegally arrested and beaten and scourged and then crucified. Just hours. So here's the prescription for peace. We'll talk about that now. Jesus laid the foundation. Don't let yourself be uh, afraid or, or upset. And you must die to the self, take your cross, follow me, and let my life now come and be your life. Okay? And uh, now Paul picks up, and James does, uh, about this peace that is going to be hard to even explain to people. Because it's so profound. Let's start first with James, the Apostle James, and then Paul. James explains, this is James the brother of Jesus. Mary had at least four sons and Two daughters, right? You can read that in Matthew, I think it's 13, verse 55, 56, somewhere in there. James explains that our trials are maturing us, perfecting us, getting us ready for eternity. The word perfect or perfect can mean complete, mature. James finished, okay? James 1, verses 2 to 4. And I do recommend you hear the sermon if you have it. The word on perfection, God's perfection. Just write it right in the, the search bar, God's perfection. James 1, verses 2 to 4. My brethren, count it all joy. Joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. James says rejoice. But why does he say rejoice? Knowing you're being perfected, knowing you're being matured. And having faith, God knows what he's doing and letting you, making you go through what you have to go through. If you want to be a Navy SEAL, you're going to go through a very rough time. So you're prepared to be a Navy SEAL. And those who can't do it, don't graduate or are kicked out. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. This is the key verse of all. Paul now fills in details of how we can have this joy and why we have this joy in our lives in, in severe times. Here's the secret to perfect peace, no matter what's going on. I'd write this down on a sticky note, stick it on your mirrors a couple places, read it every day until you know it by heart. Don't be anxious for anything. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. But in everything. When something's going on in your life, in that time, in Everything, I don't know how to define everything, the meaning everything. 
because he says it in other places, in everything, by prayer and supplication, let, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So he's saying, yes, bring your prayer requests to God. Yes, ask people to pray for you and you pray for them. But don't leave it there. Don't just ask God to heal or to solve or to fix this or this, make this better. Who are we to tell God what to do? He says, yeah, let him know you have a problem. A problem he knew was going to come before you had it. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every time you lose one. He certainly knows whatever you're praying about. And you should pray about it. He says, let your request be made known to God. Let your request. But do so, he says, with thanksgiving in everything. With thanksgiving. Everything in it. With thanksgiving. That's the part I don't think many of us are doing. And then the peace of God, verse 7, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we find these hard, these four words hard to obey. Be anxious for nothing. And then the two words in everything, no matter what. Don't be anxious about them. Don't be worried about them. Don't tell God that, that, that you're worried about it. Here's the formula. Thank him in the problem, in the test. Thank him in it. That's the secret. With thanksgiving. Then verse 7 happens. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall come upon you. So let's see how this works. By the way, Ephesians 5.20. I want to go ahead and re read that now. Ephesians 5.20 says, Give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks, I want you to hear this, always for all things to God the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks always for all things. Philippians said, get in everything, give thanks. I mean, I let your request be made known with thanksgiving. Combine the two, Paul is saying... When you have whatever is happening in your life, good or bad or painful or not, a test or not, uncomfortable or not, scary or not, don't be anxious about it. Thank God in it. Thank Him for it. Whenever I've done that, I have experienced tremendous peace. When I forget to do that or don't feel like doing that, then I go into a real worry pot of concern and it's not so good. So you've been told you have cancer. I've heard that twice now. What to do? Well, tell God, who already knows it. Present your request to God. But do so with thanksgiving while you're in it, for it, in Ephesians. Thank God in that test and for that test. I want to keep saying it because I don't, I think a lot of us pray about things. We pray for one another. How many of us say, Father in heaven, this announcement I was given that I have cancer. I'm in it. Cancer of the pancreat, pancreas, pancreatic cancer. I'm in it, Father. Thank you for this test. I thank you in this test. I thank you for this test. Most of you will initially think I am crazy. I don't know how else you read these scriptures. In James, Ephesians 4.20, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. I know it works. Because when I do it, it works. And when I do it, many times I get healed. Or other things happen that are good. So why do we want to thank him for it? It shows we trust him. It shows we believe, Romans 8.28, that all things work together for good. To those who love God and are the called. We want to wake up. We want, um, I'm sorry, we see Jesus sometimes not acting as, not acting the way we want him to. There's a big raging storm on the Sea of Galilee. Big waves are filling the boat, it says in the story. And Christ is asleep at the stern on a pillow. They would much rather he wake up and do something. 
but he's asleep. But at least he's with them. He finally gets up and says, Shalom, peace. Get out of here, you wind and rain. And boom, just like that, it stopped. Terrified, it says, the disciples, even the wind and rain, obey him. <clears throat> when we thank him for and in whatever storm is raging around us, it tells us we absolutely have faith in him and trust him. After he calmed the storm, I believe at the end of that story, he says, did you not have any faith? What's the matter with you guys? So I doubt many of us are actually thanking God for our tests and trials or in them. But it shows that we trust him. So you've been told you have cancer, present it to God, thank him for the cancer, and and uh, uh, believe what Jesus said. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavily burdened. I will give you rest. Uh, you believe, First Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. It means we believe all things are working together for good. So we can thank him in the sore trial because we know he hasn't ever left us or forsaken us. He's standing there right with us in our storm. So thank him in it. Thank him for it, as crazy as that sounds. I'm going to talk about some ways Paul did it, some ways I did it. It's a prayer mixed with, you know, I think we all pray about our concerns, but for us it's a prayer mixed with concerns and worry, seldom founded in, on the, and, and finished with thanksgiving. Even Job, after he lost all of his children, all of his servants, all of his flocks and herds, and animals, buildings destroyed, all of that was lost. Suddenly, boom, 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 just like that. What did he do? Job 1, verses 20 and 21. It says he fell to the ground and worshipped. The word worship, by the way, means bowed way down. Singing isn't the, what worship means. I, I mean, worship doesn't mean singing. It means bowing down and Praising God, praying to him many times, and says, with their head right on the ground. So I came naked from my mother's womb, naked I'll return. Jehovah gave and Jehovah has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, of, the, of Jehovah. He blessed God. I've seen people who've lost a child or a wife or a husband. Terrible, but imagine losing all your children. All, everything you have except your wife everything else. I bless your name. I bless your name. It's a great song. You should write that down. I bless your name. Uh, Selah sings it. Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir sings it. You ought to hear that. It's a fantastic song. So God is involved in some way, somehow, in all that happens to us. Sometimes, not just sometimes, but even when sin is involved, when you commit it to God, you don't necessarily thank him for sinning, but thanking him that he's going to turn even that sinful situation into something for good. So all those sins that were committed against Joseph when they sold him as a slave, and for 17 years he was you know, being nibbled on by rats in the dungeon, and all the things that were going on. Joseph says in Genesis 50, Genesis 50, verses 17 to 20, you all, my brothers, meant it for evil to try to kill me or get rid of me. You said I had died. God meant it for good. He turned these sins around so you all can be saved. And so many hundreds and thousands around the world were saved because of that. God can turn even sin into something good. An example I can give you, David and Bathsheba and the Uriah incident. Terrible, terrible sin. David suffered terribly for that, mightily for it. Consequential, consequences. But God turned even that union between David and Bathsheba to bring about what? The line of the Messiah out of that union. So even when you've sinned and as you repent, just ask God, please make something good come out of even this stuff and you'll be surprised. So... 
That's what I do. I ask for forgiveness, and I thank God that he's even able to use that to his glory. Real crazy, huh? David and Bathsheba, Joseph, others we could use. Even Paul acknowledged he had killed so many uh, by his vote and by his actions. He was a mean guy, dragging men and women into prison and torturing them hard enough that they would even, some of them, blaspheme. The result of which Paul called himself the worst of sinners, the least of all the saints, the chief sinner, unworthy to be an apostle. Things Paul said about himself. But look what God did with Paul in spite of all those sins that he repented of, walked away from, of course. When we die to self, let our life now be Christ. Everything's possible. Now, did Paul live, did he actually implement the things we're talking about? Remember, he wrote to the book to the church, to the city of Philippi, the Philippians. And in Acts 16, you can read the whole story. He goes to Philippi, and there are women praying by the river. And Paul goes there and preaches to them. Some of them get baptized, Lydia and a few others. And then later on, there was, you need 10 men to have a synagogue. So that's why they're by the river, I believe. But then later on, a demon-possessed woman who made the owner of that woman, that slave woman, a lot of money for all the fortunes that she was foretelling because she was demon-possessed. Paul got irritated by her constant, constantly her following him, cast out the demon. The man who owns this woman as a slave is horrified of all the money he's going to lose. So he accuses Paul of a lot of trash. And so Paul and Silas end up being stripped of their clothing. I don't mean if, know if that means naked or just down to their underwear, but they were stripped of their clothing and then viciously beaten with rods and then thrown into the dungeon, in the inner dungeon, into the inner cell, in stocks and chains. They undoubtedly were covered with bruises, head to toe. They had cut bodies. They had blood. Uh, they may have had some broken bones, broken ribs, and so on. Now they're locked up in chains, in stocks. They can't even move and scratch anything, touch anything. Could you thank God in a case like that? When you're in that much pain, for the beating that you've just gone through for being tied up in jail? Paul and Silas did. Let me read it out of the New Living Translation. And so it was almost midnight, though, before they began. But this same Paul, who wrote to the believers in Philippi, they knew that he practiced what he just told them about, present your request with thanksgiving. Acts 16, 25 to the end of the chapter. Living Translation, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And certainly in hymns and prayers, you're going to be constantly thanking God and blessing his name and all that. Other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off, not just Paul's. The jailer woke up to see the prison door wide open. He assumed they'd all escaped. He knew that would mean that he would be killed if they did escape. So Paul said, stop, don't kill, any, don't kill yourself, we're all here. For time's sake, I'll just summarize. The jailer runs down, asks Paul, what must I do to be saved? Paul talks to him about the Lord Jesus and salvation. The jailer washes Paul's wounds and Silas' wounds. Everyone in the household of the jailer was baptized. So when Paul wrote to the Philippians, the jailer probably and his household were probably a big part of it. A big part of it. And they could attest. That, that's right. Paul did that. He prayed with thanksgiving. He was singing hymns. While in stocks. With bleeding stripes on his back. Broken ribs. You thunk. You thunk. You think. You wouldn't have much to praise and pray about. In a case like that. But Paul did. But notice what it said. Around midnight. Verse 25. They were praying and singing to God. And right at that moment, as soon as they began to pray and praise, God delivered them. And the whole household and the Philippian jailer were all baptized. Write down the song title, I Bless Your Name, from the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. I Bless Your Name. I'll put the link in the notes. If some midnight hour, you also find yourself 
all alone in a prison of your mind like Paul and Silas. You're in pain. You're crying. You're by yourselves. You know where to turn. You feel abandoned. No, Christ is there with you. He was nailed to the cross. He was scourged. Well, turn to Messiah and our Father. Sing out and praise. Bless his name. No matter what, thank him in. Thank him for all things, everything. And our God doesn't always give us the answer we want, but one way or the other, you will feel, okay, I trust him. I'm not going to worry about this. I refuse to let it get me down. I refuse to let myself be anxious, to let myself be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. I give it to the Son of God. One night, 40 years ago, I heard my wife screaming. I was on the telephone with one of the brethren, and uh, he wanted me to come over and anoint him or send him a cloth or whatever for, for some illness. There I heard my wife scream, a scream that you can't duplicate in any of the best actors, can't duplicate it. I ran to where she was, and she was pointing at our bed in our bedroom. On the bed was our little boy. His face was dark blue. I ran over to him. His face and body were already hard. And I'd given him the last feeding with a bottle. My wife couldn't feed him for various reasons. Forty years ago, when my wife took his now hardened body in the ambulance to the hospital, I stayed back home with the girls we still had, older girls. And I got down beside the bed. I remember it like it just happened. And I said, Father, help me. I have to practice what I preach. Thank you for David. Thank you for the time we had with him. In fact, it's coming up middle of this month when he died. Thank you, for his, thank you for him. And thank you for taking him. I don't understand why you did. But I trust you. Thank you. Father, it hurts. I know all things work together for good. You must have had a purpose. I even said, Father, do you understand? Could you understand? And I felt so stupid. I said, of course, Father, you could. You've lost your only son, just like I just did. Of course you understand. But so in this test and for this test, I'm still learning what this means, Father. Thank you. Thank you for David. I thank you. Even in his death, you know what you're doing. At the gravesite, the grave digger commended my wife and I for the peace he felt we had. Such a terrible time, even though part of me just wanted to jump into that little grave. It was so little. It was so little. That little grave. But yes, there was peace. Even though we didn't get him back. Another time, about 15 years later, my doctor's office said, Mr. Shields, get in here quick, right now, stat, right now. I said, look, I'm quite a ways away from the, uh, from the clinic. What's going on? Can't you tell me? And the, the doctor herself got on the phone. Mr. Shields, now get in here. When I got there, she basically told me, this is not good news. You have pancreatic and liver cancer. I want to do a lot more tests to be absolutely certain. And they did take those additional tests. And I remember a tear welling up in my eye, and I, my son must have been around 10 or 11 at that time. And I said to her, if it's pancreatic and liver cancer, that usually doesn't last long, does it? It's like four or five months, three months. She said, yes, it's not going to take long if that's what it is. It seems that way. The short story is we had more specialist tests and so on. And then I began to thank God for the time he'd given me on earth. And I went back in for another specialist report. The doctor swung the door open. I was sitting there on the cot without 
regular clothes on. I just had this crazy thing they give you in the hospitals where your whole backside's exposed, you know, behind it. I was sitting there. He swings open the door like that, just like that. And he says, where have you been going? Who have you been seeing? What have you been doing? In one hand, he had a whole bunch of papers on the right hand and just a few, maybe three or four or five sheets in the left hand, just a few compared to the right hand. And I said, what, what do you mean? He says, well, in this right hand here, these are all the previous deaths, and you were not going to live long, Philip. You're not going to live long. Pancreatic, liver cancer. In this left hand, we don't understand it. But all the stuff in this right hand is gone. There's no pancreatic cancer. There's no liver cancer. It's like 20-some plus years ago now. I could still die of cancer. God wills it. But that particular time, I didn't. So then I said, well, I went to a different doctor. He says, that's what I want to know. I said, I went to Dr. Jesus. <laughs> he laughed. He said, so, so you're a believer. I said, yes, doctor. I'm a believer in healing in Jesus Christ, my healer. And he says, so, so am I. And he says, Mr. Shields, you have been healed. You have been healed. And we talked for a while longer. Then as he left the room, he said, you may go now. You have no cancer. And as he left the room, he said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And I joined in with him. So I'm not perfect in practicing this. And sometimes when I thank God for and in something, the issue doesn't always go away. Sometimes it even gets worse. But it's peace that comes upon me because I trust him. I am his. He will never leave me nor forsake me. Let me read you a story of another one. This is King Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicles 20. He'd been told that Moabites, Ammonites, Mount Seir, armies were coming towards them to destroy Jerusalem. People from around Judea came to Jerusalem. They had, they had walls, but uh, Jerusalem's been attacked so many times. And these would be modern-day Jordanians, I believe. You know, Ammon, Ammon, doesn't matter. Lots and lots of them. And he prays before God on his bed and says, look, there, all these people are coming and, and you told us not to go through Moab or Ammon because we're related to them. And look how they pay us back. You can go back and read the story in Second Chronicles 20. And then the whole congregation of Israel came together, of Judah, I mean, came together there in the temple area, in the open, you know, the open platform there. And um, as they were praying and talking to God and Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, telling them what was going on, one of the Levites stood up and said, listen to me, God's given me a message for all of you. We have nothing to fear. He's going to fight for us. But what we've got to do is we've got to leave the safety of the walls, go out tomorrow morning, face those armies, and God will fight for us. We will stand still and watch the salvation of the Lord. Yeah, right. Leave the safety of the walls and go outside and face these, 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 this massive armies, massive army. So they arose the next morning. I'm starting Second Chronicles 20, verse 20. They arose the next morning, went out to the wilderness of Tekoa, and as they went, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe, believe, faith in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, you shall prosper. And when he consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to Jehovah and who should praise the beauty of holiness. And they went out in front of, before the army, and were singing, saying, Praise the Lord, praise Jehovah, for his mercy endures forever. So Jehoshaphat said, wait, something's wrong here. We have the SEAL team in front. We have the Army Rangers in front. We have the 101st Airborne in front. We can't have this. This, is, this means we're looking to our own ability to fight. We were told we can stand still and watch. Singers, choir, get over here. You lead it. When they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes. 
against Moab, against Judah. And my, I, I mean, against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. My eyes aren't so good, so I, my eyes skip. The Lord sent ambushes, ambushes who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir. They killed each other, basically is what he's saying, until they were all gone. It took them three days, took the Jews three days to, to, uh, uh, to take all the spoils of the war. Three days of clothing and jewelry and gold and silver. And they didn't have to fight. When they began to sing and to praise, 2 Chronicles 20, 22, when they began to sing the thank yous, the praises, praise eternal, for his mercy endures forever. Praise Jehovah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord is where we get the Hebrew word hallelujah, by the way. Praise Yah. Now let's read we'll, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 10. And we'll wrap up with these, the scripture and one little more. 2 Corinthians 12. Paul talks about the time he, he was taken to heaven by a vision that was so real, it, he, he didn't know if it was a vision or, the, or himself. But lest I should be exalted above measure and be boastful about it, God gave me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. I begged him. I prayed about it. I presented before God, like he said, and he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. When people see that you have issues, whatever that thorn in the flesh was, and you keep working hard and producing, they'll know it's not you. They'll know it's me helping you with that. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will gladly rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure. Like James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecution and distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Take pleasure. Because I trust him. I love him, and I know he loves me and will never forsake me or leave me. Never, nor you. So whether you get the answer you want or don't get the answer you want, sometimes you get a far better answer than you ever dreamed. Sometimes it doesn't happen. It doesn't matter. You thank him for it and in it anyway. Because we trust him that through the suffering, like James says, and also Romans 5 says this, that through the suffering we build hope and perseverance and character and, 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 and we grow and we overcome. We're being perfected to keep me from being conceited. Messenger of Satan. So I boast. I delight in the NIV verse 10. That's why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. I delight in them because I know God's doing something, perfecting me, maturing me, getting me ready. And I really honestly think the more we thank God and trust him, we're going to start seeing more healings and miracles. I really believe it. I certainly have. We've had all these hurricanes that have come through and Several times, they're supposed to come right over our house and we praise God in the storm. And it moves. It seems just like a heavy rainstorm to us for a couple hours. And that's it. So far, it's been like that. If we have a kind of hurricane that doesn't move away but demolishes our house, yeah, that will be a test. I hope I'm learning enough, though, that I'll say thank you, even in this storm. I'm alive. Thank you. We can rebuild. Thank you. I know you're here with us. Thank you. But when you thank God, it seems like he does give us powerful answers. Let me read again Isaiah 26.3. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. It's because we trust him that we not only keep our eyes focused on him, but in that focus we say, 
thank you in the problem. Thank you for the problem. Just see what happens in your heart when you start thanking him for that incredible pain you're going through. I had plantar fasciitis one time so bad, the doctor said, you will never walk again without a cane or walker. Never. I've never seen it this bad, he said. Plantar fasciitis, when the connection at the top of your feet and, and down here by the heel, are, in my case, they're both ripped off. And the pain was enormous. I couldn't put any pressure on my, on my foot. My, but anyway, started thanking God in that for it. And one day I woke up and I thought, I don't have any of it. It's all gone. I play pickleball. I go run. I do other things. I'm playing baseball with the kids on Sunday. You'll keep in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on you because he trusts in you. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Bow your heads, please, with me. Father in heaven, we just come before you, and wow, you never leave us, you never forsake us. You're very involved in us. Jesus, our Savior, thank you. Please come and live in us. Live. You are so perfect. You just live the... Everything you said was what Father told you to say. Everything you did was what Father told you to do. So in the pains and sufferings and tests we have and the ones that are coming up big time in the years ahead, help us to learn to thank you in them and for them. We lift up our hands in praise to you. Glorify your holy name. Please pour out on your children this perfect peace, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding into all of our hearts. Bring peace to all of us here. May you Look down on us with joy. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.